Thank you, Jesus. Why don't we clap our hands together and praise. Lord, you're worthy tonight, Jesus. We worship you. We praise you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Amen. It's good to praise the Lord. Amen. It's good to praise the Lord tonight. Amen. Tonight, sing hallelujah. Yes, we sing to you. Bless ye the Lord. Hallelujah. Bless ye. together tonight. Hallelujah, Jesus. Lord, we lift our hands to you tonight, God. We lift our praise to you. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. God is truly worthy of our praise tonight. Amen. He's worthy of our words of adoration. Amen. The expression, the heartfelt expression of worship. 
Amen. And gratitude unto him. He's worthy of everything we can ever give. Amen. And then so much more. You love the Lord tonight? Amen. Well, some of us do. <laughs> God is good to all of us tonight. Amen. We're going to take our needs before the Lord, believing that God can hear and answer prayer. Amen. Does anyone have any needs tonight they'd like to raise before the church? Let's remember Rose Chopic tonight. Amen. Anyone else? Amen. Sister Rose. Amen. God can heal. And God can touch. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Let's take our needs before the Lord tonight. Join with me tonight in prayer in Jesus' name. Oh, God, today. We're so grateful tonight, Lord, that we can come before your presence, Lord, that we can come before your throne tonight, God, that we can feel your presence, Jesus, as we praise and worship you, Lord. But God, we're also so grateful that we can take time and present our needs and our request to a God who loves us unconditionally, to a God who cares for us, and to a God who's able to do exceeding abundantly above all we could ask or even think according to the power that works within us. So, Lord, we lift up Rose tonight. God, we pray that you would touch her in a special way. God, we pray, Lord, for these that are sick with COVID tonight. God, we know that you're able to heal. We know that you're able to deliver. We know that you're able to save, Lord. And we believe tonight that nothing is too hard for you. So we lift them before you tonight, Jesus, asking that you would do what only you can do today. And we'll give you all the praise. We'll give you all the glory. We thank you for hearing our prayer tonight. And we ask these things in the wonderful name of Jesus Christ. And everyone said in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. You are holy. You are holy. We will offer our praise in a mighty chorus. You are holy. You are holy. Wonderful in all your ways. Holy you are We will offer you 
our praise in a mighty chorus. You are holy. You are holy. Wonderful in all your ways. Holy you are. presence of the Lord as we lift his name up and worship him. Why don't we do that just again one time more? Hallelujah. God, we love you today. We praise you. We worship you. Thank you for your goodness, Lord. Thank you for your goodness, Lord. Thank you for this opportunity to be in your presence. Oh, God, how wonderful today to be in your presence. For in your presence is fullness of joy. Oh, God, tonight at your right hand, pleasures forevermore. Oh, God, we thank you today for your presence in this house together tonight. And we thank you for it. We thank you for it. Amen. Amen. God bless you. May be seated. So good to be together this, this evening in the house of the Lord for Oasis service. And certainly when we come into the house of God on a midweek night, Amen. What a wonderful thing to feel his presence. What a wonderful thing to have the touch of God's spirit grace our lives. And I hope when you came in the doors tonight, amen, you was able to push off the busy week, push off the million one things that occupying your mind and just concentrate on worshiping the Lord, feeling his presence. Amen. We can pick up all those things when we get up tomorrow. Amen. Or if you're really desperate when you get home tonight. Amen. But in his presence, what a, what a wonderful opportunity to be in the presence of God. And I'm glad I serve a God of whose presence we can come into. Amen. And he delights in it. He inhabits our praise. He lives and tabernacles with us. Amen. Don't we serve a great God tonight? Hallelujah. Let's give him a hand of praise tonight. Hallelujah. God, we thank you today. We praise you. Amen. Amen. Uh, just by way of announcements tonight, Saturday praise and prayer at 7 o'clock, and then Sunday morning service at, uh, at 11 through this month, and then we'll be reverting our schedule backwards uh, uh, some after August when we get into September. But uh, looking forward to getting back to rec regular schedule. And uh, we welcome you tonight in the name of the Lord. Good to see you, Sister Upton Grove again. Amen. And we're asking Andon to come tonight and share the word of the Lord. And uh, let's open our hearts as we open the word of God tonight.
Praise the Lord, everyone. Tonight, we're gonna be, uh, <clears throat> our lesson's going to be about something that is contagious. And thankfully, we're not talking about COVID for once. We're talking about faith that reaches out to others. Who believes that faith can be contagious? Yeah. <clears throat> Tonight, our scripture is found in uh, uh, Jude uh, 22, 23. Now we're contending for the faith, the faith that reaches to others. <clears throat> so, and some have compassion, making a difference, and others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garments spotted by the flesh. <clears throat> the New Testament church started in the fire. There was a miraculous outpouring of the Holy Ghost and physical healings, that happened not only in front of the entire population of Jerusalem, but also in front of the, the, the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin was a ruling class of religious leaders. And they were not happy that the power of God was being demonstrated through what they would consider common men. That was for them. It wasn't for everybody else. The lame man who sat by the gate received healing. He disrupted the traditions and routines of the temple. His exuberance was not welcomed in the sight of, uh, in the eyes of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. So he was arrested along with Peter and John, who prayed for him, presumably for disturbing the peace. So these were uncharted waters, even for the Sanhedrin. <clears throat> Arresting someone for underlying cr crime of healing someone was kind of a public relations disaster. Well, you, you can't go out there and make people's lives better how do you explain that one what are these men arrested for well they helped a man walk for the first time ever it's not really plausible reason for arresting someone the elders and rulers wrestle with the facts of the case and the potential nightmare of losing political and religious control with further mir miracles but in the meantime peter and john were not making it any easier for the sanhedrin as they continued to state that they had a mandate to teach and preach the things that they had seen and heard. And the council decided to give them a stern warning and let them go. Kind of stuck between a rock and a hard place. They wanted to do something about it, but there wasn't much they could do. Peter and John quickly returned to the other disciples and the followers of Christ. And they reported what had happened to them on their way to the temple that day. They gave the details of the healing of the lame man and the rest that, uh, fo that followed. So no doubt they recounted the threats of warning from the Sanhedrin. The reaction this young church had to the issues at hand were astonishing. So instead of being afraid and cautious, they were filled with boldness and courage. The rumor they were gathered in became a church as this group of believers began to worship God. They implored heaven to give them greater boldness. The faith of Peter and John was contagious, and it was quickly ignited it quickly ignited a firestorm of faith for every believer. The reaction of heaven is a lesson for us all. After the people had prayed, the place where they were assembled began to shake with the power of God, and the people were filled with the Holy Ghost and were given what they had requested, a greater boldness. A spirit of unity came upon a small group, and there was such a move of God that the people sacrificed their own personal possessions for the good of the group. <clears throat> so, contending for the faith by facing our fears has an impact on the faith of others. So the courage it takes for us to face our fears resonates with others because everyone has some fear they're facing. Don't believe me? Grab a spider and chase Stephanie. She will run. I, I have a couple of, I have quite a few grown men that work for me that are deathly afraid of spiders, and I enjoy chasing them with spiders. <clears throat> but the fuel for the faith is found in knowing we are not trying to conquer our fears alone. 
facing your fear in front of others is a great way to show boldness and, and, and courage. A lot of people, a lot of times you hear about soldiers or people who are asked, how, how are you not fearful? How are you so courageous? And, and they usually say, it's not that I'm not fearful, I am very scared, I just do it in spite of that. What could inspire somebody so much in their faith to go against something that they fear so much? What great faith it must be. What, what so much, must they have so much faith in if they're willing to go against their fears? And that inspires others. There must be something to this. Why are they, why are they going up against their own fears? What, why is it worth it? So <clears throat> let's look at some biblical principles that will help guide us through having a contagious faith. Sorry, still learning this. Well, I don't know what I'm doing, sorry. The principle of information. Get that in there. The courage it takes for us to face our fears resonates with others because, I'm sorry, um, Proverbs 13, 16 says, Every prudent man dealeth with knowledge, but a fool layeth open his folly, Faith is not ignoring the facts. Faith is not based on idealism or naivety, naivety. It is based on knowing and moving forward because the belief is stronger than the fear. So if we look at great acts of faith in the Bible, like David slaying uh, Goliath, Daniel surviving the lion's den, or even J Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead, none of these miracles were based on ignoring facts. These individuals did not act without knowledge. They acted despite their knowledge. So no one has better clarity than Jesus. He has more knowledge and wisdom than anyone, yet he continues to work from the realm of the miraculous and supernatural. We must not be afraid of the information in front of us. All right. So the principle of evaluation. There is nothing unscriptural or unspiritual about weighing pros and cons. Some people really like to do that. Some people really like to, before they make a decision, if they have the time, to weigh out what's the good and the bad in something. <clears throat> in Luke uh, chapter 14, verses 28 through 31, it says, For which of you, intending to build a tower, sitteth not down first and counteth the cost, whether he have sufficient to finish it. Lest haply, after he hath laid down the foundation and is not able to finish it, what be all that behold it began to mock him, saying, <clears throat> This man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king, going to make war against another king, sitteth down not first and consulteth whether he be able to with 10,000 to meet him that come against him with 20,000. That resonates a lot with me because I build small towers, but we always have to sit down first. Can we make money on this job? We take the time to make that. It's, it's a big risk when you're, when you're talking about hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of work and whether we can do it. So my boss sits down and he crunches the numbers and he asks me how long we can get it done first. We count the cost. What's it going to cost us? What are we going to make? The people who we work for, are they going to, they always have to count the cost as well. How much can this guy work for? How much can this guy work for? And of course, just like it says in the Bible, people count the cost. And David himself asked three times what the reward was before he fought Goliath. He wanted to know, if I get myself into this, is there a reward? Is there something for me in this? You know, I, obviously, if I beat Goliath, that's, that's pretty cool. But, like, is, do I get something else? He asked three times what, what the cost, uh, what the reward would be. It is wise to count the cost because everything we believe in has a price tag. If we believe in right things, it will become contagious, and it will help increase the faith of those around us. The principle of preparation. <clears throat> Some falsely believe that faith is exercised when emotion trumps logic or that somehow faith is a knee-jerk reaction to a feeling that is not based on careful planning. But however, it's quite really the opposite. 
uh, the Bible says Noah believed and prepared an ark to save his family. He truly believed, or he would not have done that. He spent a long time on it. But he had a lot of planning to do. Noah believed the word of God, and it caused him to prepare an ark. Sin and lust work with the instant gratification appetite of our flesh. But faith is the complete opposite. Faith is patient. Faith is persistent. Faith sees the big picture. And contagious faith is based on careful planning that reinforces the decisions to believe and to act upon it. So how can we be deliberate in our faith and still act in such a way that others are drawn to that courage? If when something is presented to you with a great amount of fear, how you respond to that is when others are watching, especially. If you're by yourself, you probably won't be that contagious. No one knows that's happening. But we actually had an incident about a week ago at work that became quite serious quite fast. And looking back at it now, it might not have been as serious. And I know I've told a few of you already, but one of my employees was working right above my, my job site office. And he raised the boom of a machine up, doing something he wasn't really supposed to do. But I, uh, as a supervisor, I probably, according to WorkSafe, I wasn't supervising well enough either. Um, but he raised the boom up and knocked out some power lines, which is a very dangerous thing. My power went out in my office, and I, I opened the door, and people started screaming at me. Stop, don't move, don't move. There's down power lines all around your trailer. He jumps out of a man lift. I had three guys in a ditch with a down power line on fire about three feet from them. They're stuck. I'm stuck in my office for about 40 minutes while we get hydro and the fire department out. Things are burning all around us. And one of my employees was in my office with me. And the entire time, he was getting more and more worked out. We're talking about a 25, 26-year-old man who likes to pretend he's tough. He's one of the ones afraid of spiders, though. And... Um, at one point, I, I, we're not allowed to move. We're standing in the middle of the office just in case we're in a metal bin underneath power lines that are on fire. And I'm kind of making jokes of it because I figure, you know, I'm going to be okay. We'll just stand here for a few minutes. I mean, it's a metal bin. It's got a wood floor. So it should be fine. And I turn around. He's gone. And he's hiding underneath the desk in the back of the office. Like, what are you doing? You're scared to death. He says, I don't want to die. I don't want to die. And, and I just, I jokingly, I looked at him. I said, I know you call yourself an atheist, but are you ready to talk about Jesus? He looked at me, he said, dead in the face, and says, I'm really serious. I might be ready to become a Christian right now. He's like, I'm not joking. I know you think I am. And so I kind of teased him about that a bit, and I just said, and he just said, how are you not scared? I said, I don't want to die. I have a family. I don't want that to happen. I said, but I don't think I will. I said, I just, I don't, I don't think God will let that happen to me. And I said, if it does, I don't want to think about it. If it happens... It's nothing I can do about it. I said, so, so panicking right now. I, and I, I just told him, I said, I don't want to die this moment. But if I do, I get to see Jesus. And that didn't make sense to him. And it didn't make sense to my other coworkers. But in that, when I was reading this letter and I was studying, I was thinking about that. And no, I don't think I had a bunch of courage. And a lot of people think maybe I'm just a little stupid for that. But it's just the way I am. I, I, if it's something I can't control, it's nothing I can do, no, I'm not going to. I wasn't going to step out of my office to where there was live power lines. And it turns out later there were low voltage, and it probably would have just given me a real good shock. And the high voltage was untouched. But we didn't know it at the time. But the whole point of that is, is if we are deathly afraid of everything around us, our actions will show that we have little faith in what God can do, what God can save from. Does that mean nothing will ever happen to us? Absolutely not. The Bible is full of examples of where bad things did still happen to good people. But look at, look at Job. Through it all, Job still had faith in God. He still loved God. Through it all, I don't want to have Job's testimony. It's a, a painful and sad testimony. But I, I wouldn't mind having the, the, the testimony that I was able to still stand for God through all of it. I just don't want to have to go through the bad part. But if we're deliberate in our, our faith and still act in such a way, we can act in such a way that others are drawn to that courage. I am afraid of power lines. I'm not stupid. But the simple fact is, is that I have a greater faith in my God. And I didn't think God was going to let me get hurt that day. And of course, my employee who did it is one of my very close friends. And he was, I think, panicked the most because he, he wasn't even in danger. He thought we were going to get hurt. But the long and short of it is, is 
When we have faith in God, we know God, he, he will either he will deliver us or he will take us home. One of the two things, but we can have faith that we know he is there for us. The next principle is the principle of declaration. So the Lord told his disciples that they needed to have faith that would have caused them to speak to their mountain, and he would give them this promise, the mountain or obstacle would be removed, and nothing would be impossible unto them. Now, I hope nobody around here starts removing our mountains, but that's quite a lot of faith to be able to move an entire mountain. But we know that everything that God has ever said, he has been able to do. Anything, I mean, he placed the mountains there with his word. So for faith to be contagious, it must be spoken. Spoken faith not only reinforces our own resolve, but it also ignites a fire in others. We must not speak negative thoughts and then wonder why we are fearful. We must speak the promises of God, and they will build courage and faith. You know, sometimes the easiest way to remember something is to say it out loud. Repeat it to yourself. In fact, a lot of my employees wonder how I can remember numbers so well, but a lot of time when I take a measurement, I'll say it to myself four or five times. If you are speaking out in faith repeatedly, what is the first thing your brain will go to? God can get me through it. You're always telling me, God can do anything. Well, I'm in a bad situation right now. What's going to happen? God can get me. God can do anything. What am I going to do about this? God can do anything. If you are always speaking it out, the first thing that will come, it's like muscle memory. You do something enough times, eventually it becomes your muscle memory becomes over and over. Your brain is the same way. The more you practice and speak faith, the more when the time comes, faith will be right there on your lips. <clears throat> Next point is the principle of initiation. So we may plan, pray, declare, but then many of us still will drop the ball. Why? Because we do not initiate. So we want God to open a door while we just walk through. But, of course, but we have to not. We have to initiate. So the first time the children of Israel crossed a major body of water, the Red Sea, it opened up to them, allowing them to cross on dry ground. However, before they could cross into the Promised Land, they had to step into the Jordan River. And only then did the waters part. If we step into our miracle, others will join. The Bible records the story of a sick lady hungry for a miracle from God. Though she had a very socially embarrassing disease, she decided to pursue God, regardless of any possible embarrassment. She wasn't caring about her self-esteem at the moment. She received her miracle from Jesus without even, Jesus even praying for her or even touching her. She simply touched the hem of his garment and her faith in action triggered healing virtue to begin flowing out of his body, healing her sickness. Her actions is what did it. She acted in faith. She initiated something. There was crowds and crowds around Jesus. It was hard to get to him. She pushed her way through the crowd. She didn't care. She knew, she knew enough to have faith in Jesus that even just if I could just get a hold of anything that's connected to him. If I could, to her, when she thought the hem of the garment, that became the part that was going to heal her because her faith was placed in just anything that even touched Jesus because that's where her faith was based. And Jesus knew immediately. So fear lives in the land of passiv passivity. Fear struggles to stay alive with people of action. You know, it's a lot easier to be scared of something the more you think about it. A lot of times if I'm, if I'm scared or nervous about something at work, the more I think about it, the worse it gets. And it never, ever ends up being that bad. But it, try telling yourself that when you're sitting there thinking of it. But if you put something into action, if you just, I always find when I just get to work, if, I, if I'm nervous, I don't know how to do something, I don't know how to build something, it's something new, I'm not sure what to do. If I, I just told my boss the other day, he says, do you know how to build this part yet? I said, no. He said, what are you going to do? I said, I'm just going to start building it. If I start messing up, I'll just keep adjusting, keep moving. Because when you put something into action, if you just start putting it into action, it's a lot easier to put aside the fear because you are doing something about it. When you have fear about something, if you start putting your faith into action, it will start pushing away the negative thoughts, the negative fears, and, and it will start giving you a sense of that something is happening and your faith is moving forward. So faith is contagious when it's exercised. 
The Bible never records Jesus attending any funeral, but he raised three people from the dead, Jairus' daughter, Lazarus, and the widow's son from Nain. And they were all young people. Jesus did not heal Jairus' daughter until he did three things. One, Jesus asked the people gathered there why they were crying and wailing, and he told them the girl was not dead. She was only asleep. So by asking this question, he was able to see who believed and who did not. Second, Jesus put the critics and skeptics out of the room. He wanted only those who believed to be around him because faith is contagious. It would be hard trying to raise a girl from the dead when everybody's telling you, I mean, of course, Jesus could he could have done it anyway. But faith is contagious. It meant a lot more to those who were invited into the room to see that moment, which would play a pivotal role, pivotal role on the lives of those he brought into the room. Three, Jesus did not pray for the girl. He just spoke to her and said, child, arise. Very significant. It wasn't a prayer. It, wasn't, it was just a command. By saying that, it was no longer, well, she was dead. No, she was asleep. And Jesus told her, arise, child, arise. So Jesus had invited his inner circle of disciples into the room with him, Peter, James, and John. They must have been thinking how incredible it was to be part of something so miraculous. But Jesus' act, actions of faith, of course, it's Jesus, right? Hard to say, well, was, what, what, was it faith? I mean, he knows, right? But you got to look at it from Peter, James, and John perspective. They're still really learning a lot about Jesus at this point, right? He's even sometimes recorded where you know, Jesus had to ask him, do you know who I really am? They're still figuring out everything, and Jesus brought them in there. He said, no, she's not dead. You guys, you guys believe she's not dead? Okay, come in here. And he didn't pray. It wasn't a prayer, even though he had exemplified prayer for them before. He just said, no, child, arise. He showed them your actions. You, you can simply, in the name, just say it, and it will happen. And he showed them that. So later when Peter prayed for a young lady, Dorcas, who had died, he operated in faith as Jesus had. Why did they call for Peter when this young lady had died? Because he had been with Jesus. He obviously knew whatever Jesus did behind closed doors, right? So he must have known the trick. Really what it was is his faith in action. Peter said, well, I, th this is possible. I know this is possible because I've seen Jesus do it. And Jesus said that we have his power if we just speak it. So what did Peter do? He put it into action. And people also called Peter because they had heard. And they knew what, was capable, what he was capable of because they knew what Jesus had taught him. <clears throat> people have been with Jesus, who have been with Jesus, are able to make a difference in the lives of others. Exercise faith spreads to the masses when it is birthed in the company of a few. So when we lift up the Lord by exercising our faith, the faith of non-believers increases. When we lift up the Lord in three ways, through faith, joy, and worship, each time we lift up the Lord, the faith, the faith in others is increased. Jesus said, And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. So when we lift up the Lord in faith, joy, or in worship, it becomes a form of praise that spreads to others, and it is contagious. You know, it's so funny because as a boss, I, I have a, when my workers are all together, they like to laugh at me because I believe in God. But I have a, such a close relationship with most of my workers. They're like family to me. I love it. Each and every one of those boys, they're very important to me. Most of them have all worked for me for, for multiple years now. And, uh, and the young ones, you know, they're quickly becoming very close. Whenever they have problems... I'm the one they call. They all like to joke that I'm their emergency contact. I've had some of my employees call me for after being arrested, not, not even that work for me right now. I'm the one they call because when they have something bad, they turn to me. It's not because I'm a great problem solver. In fact, I can't solve most of their problems. But they know when they have something wrong, I always say, I will pray for you. I have no problem telling them that. I'm very happy to tell them that. I want them to know that somebody cares them about them enough to, to pray for them. They know I have faith. When something as bad as wrong, it's not me that is the difference, but it is my faith in God. Because 
they believe me when I, I talk to them. And yes, they might like to tease me and stuff. Say, oh, you go to church. Oh, you believe in God. Or they'll send me signs, like jokes about, oh, how God's not real. And you believe whatever you want. I, say, I always tell them, you can't have experienced what I have experienced in my life and not believe in God. You have not experienced it. I understand that. So it's harder for you to believe. But from what I've experienced in my life, I will believe. And you won't change that. I put that into action. And there is a reason why they turn to me. It's because we put faith, I put faith in action. I try to, especially where they're concerned, of course, because I don't want, even if I ever have my own doubts about certain situations, we do have that sometimes. We can have faith. Sometimes it's easier to have faith for other situations than our own. Reality, sometimes I, I found myself, you know, I, I'd, I'd tell one of my workers or one of my friends to have faith in the situation and we'll pray for them and then something comes up for myself and I think, well, what was I thinking? Where, where was my faith there? But we do have to remember those who are non-believers. They see what you what you believe. They see what you what 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 you, what you're afraid of and what you're not. They understand. So exercising our faith can affect unbelievers in a very positive way. Um, lack of faith also, I think, should be noted that can affect non-believers. Oh, you go to church every Sunday, but you're worried about every little thing. I'm not saying we don't get worried. Of course we do. We, de we can deal with it in a different way. Adversity. Adversity creates an environment that makes a strong faith spread to others. So Paul and Silas in Philippi use adversity to bring revival by contending for the faith. Paul and Silas sang and worshipped even though they were hurting. This exercise faith spreads to others around them. Paul standing for faith brought the attention of the Almighty with a physical and spiritual earthquake. <clears throat> the faith of Paul and Silas caused them not to run when the prison bars were open, and faith caused the jailer and his household to desire salvation. Paul refused to be released privately when he had been punished publicly. All of Philippi was affected. People who claim there is no God have never felt his power. Just like I was saying, to, like I said to my workers, you cannot, having experienced what I have experienced in my life, there's no way that I cannot ever believe in God. For the rest of my life, there will, there will, even if everything were to change in my life, you can never change the experience. And that's why it's so hard for some people to believe because they have not experienced that. In any bit, little bit of God they have experienced, they didn't understand what it was. That's why people have to learn through our faith. I've heard many times my dad preach, and I've even repeated him quite a few times, is we, we, can't, we can't be saved for others. We can have faith for others. Because we can have faith, we can build something that is contagious. And that faith we know can lead to salvation. People may debate who Jesus is in the cold, empty halls of humanism, but only if they have never been healed, touched, or delivered. Once we have felt his love, once we have felt the weight of sin removed, and once we have felt the joy of the Lord, not only are we changed, but that revelation can also change others. Faith works in tandem with evidence. <clears throat> Paul stood for his faith in the midst of a storm, and the entire ship was saved. So Paul had appealed to Caesar after being arrested by Jewish authorities <clears throat> for preaching to the gospel. The Roman authorities were transporting him and other prisoners by a boat across the Mediterranean Sea. There was a large storm. The ship and his passengers um, were in danger. Paul took leadership. And he told everyone on the ship that they would be saved if they remained on the boat. Paul explained that he had been visited by an angel who, would, who had given him assurance and instructions the Roman authorities, as well as the crew, had to believe Paul in order to follow the instructions. The faith Paul of Paul encouraged others. Though they lost the ship in the storm, all the people on board were able to get a small island named Melita. Nowadays, we call it Malta. And on the island of Melita, the faith of Paul changed the minds of the natives after the members of a sinking ship found boards and other fragments of the broken vessel to float upon. They made their way to land, arriving cold and wet and no doubt shaken up. The natives of the island helped them prepare a fire to warm themselves. 
And while gathering the wood for the fire, a poisonous viper came out of the wood and bit Paul. Immediately, Paul flung the snake into the fire, and the island natives assumed he was a guilty prisoner. They were superstitious in their beliefs and concluded that though this man had escaped the sea, he was being judged by the gods, what they believed were the gods. They waited for him to swell up and die, but Paul never even got sick. You got to remember, these people knew what knew they knew this snake. You know, where, where we are, we don't have venomous snakes. We have garter snakes. But, you know, people in Australia, they can tell you which snakes are poisonous and which aren't. People in Malta, they, when they saw this, they knew it was a viper. And they knew that it was poisonous. And they knew, there, especially in those days, there was no surviving. You would swell up and you would die. Um, <clears throat> but they changed their opinion of Paul and began to think it was possible that instead of being a guilty prisoner, Paul could be a god himself. You know, they were pagan. They, they believed in different gods. Uh, soon, others on the island with sickness came to see him and were healed. And the faith of Paul changed the minds of the people. Of course, they came to Paul thinking he was a god, but immediately Paul was able to explain to him, to them, and, and to witness to them that it wasn't him. Of course, it was God who was working through him, right? And they were very receptive to that because instead of being like, and I'll, no matter how long I've had faith or how long I've had the Holy Ghost, if a snake bites me, I don't know if I'll be able just to fling it in the fire. I'll probably head straight to the hospital. I don't know if I'll be able to hang around long enough. Paul didn't have that option. But I'm just saying, I don't know if I, again, I don't know if I could stand there and just be like, well, I'll, God will take care of it. I like to, you know, I think I, I could stand there and be that courageous. But people saw that and immediately thought, well, he must be awful. He survived a shipwreck, but the gods want him dead. But then when he survived, now he has an opportunity to say, no, I knew I would survive because this is not my end yet. God has more for me to do. And um, I'm sure there was part of Paul that thought, I might be dying here. And he probably thought, well, I, if this is the way God wants me to go, then so be it. But because the way he reacted and the way he had faith and the way he moved forward, he was able to witness to a whole island of people. Word spread to all those who were sick on the island. <clears throat> Adversity can bring out the best in us. How we respond and react to adverse situations can bring out the best in, in us. It can also bring out the worst in us. If we choose to panic and react in fear, and I'm not saying that you're an awful person if you, if you panic and react in fear. That's part of our human nature. But it's learned to practice faith, to put into action, to speak it, to initiate it, repetitive use of it, exercising it. And that becomes when you're faced with adversity, that's when it can take over. There's sometimes new Christians can have great amount of faith. But, it, and that's usually because of a new and, 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 and amazing experience. But a lot of times you'll see the greatest faith out of elders who have spent their entire lives living for God. Why? Spoken. Acted, exercised, repeated, practiced, initiated time and again. It's worked before, it'll work again. God's done it before, he'll do it again. And that's why it's sometimes those who have practiced great faith many times have the greatest reactions to adversity. So Jesus, <clears throat> the greatest contender for the faith, stood strong at Calvary and brought salvation to the world. Standing for what we believe in is not done in isolation. The faith is shown in one person can be replicated in others. Contending for the faith is acting in faith and allowing that faith to stir the gift in others. <clears throat> we can learn through hardships that will be a blessing to others. Who wants to learn through hardships? Anybody? That doesn't mean hardships aren't going to come. And we can learn through those. You know... The best way to learn is when you, you know, if, if something has already happened, learn from it. Move on from it. I've told my boss many times, he said, well, how did you know to do that? I said, well, last time I did it this way, it didn't work out so well. So I learned if I do that again, it's going to be a mess again. So I started doing it this way. We learn from hardship. If we actually take the time to learn from hardship, it, can, it will be a blessing to others because we will learn how to react and change ourselves in the future. So just to finish up tonight, many years ago, 
As a young man, uh, this is a story um, by a man named David Myers. He was evangelizing in, in Indiana. One night, I was preaching in a church, and I had preached that I preached in many times before. I was preaching on faith, but it seemed I was not connecting with my audience. I started praying while I was preaching, asking God to do a visible miracle that would increase the faith of the church. The Lord spoke to me and let me know that there was a man in the service who needed to, delivered, to be delivered from nicotine. My plan was to have him delivered by God supernaturally, and then, after the miracle was confirmed, we could have him testify. Nope, that was my plan, but it was not God's. My plan was to take all the risk out of it, but God let me know in no uncertain terms that the miracle was going to be dependent on my willingness to step out in faith. I was directed by the Holy Ghost to a giant of a man in the audience, and I stopped preaching and called the man out. I said publicly what the Holy Ghost had taught, told me, and the man lifted up his hands and began to cry. I went back to where he was standing, and I stood on the pew in front of him so I could get my hand on his head. As we prayed, he began to shout and proclaim very loudly that he was free. After this, he ran out the back door. I looked around, and the pastor looked at me. I did not know what to do next. It appeared the man was gone for good. Soon, he came running back in and threw several packs of cigarettes on the floor in the altar area. He began to step on the packs and smash them. I could tell the pastor was wondering what they were going to do to get all that out of the carpet. The man received the Holy Ghost and immediately requested the microphone. I gave him the microphone and he began to share his testimony. He had never been in a church before, and just a few days earlier, his doctor had told him he only had six months left to live because of lung cancer. He said as he drove by the church that night, a voice told him to go into the, the church and he would be healed. He thought it was just his radio and he was he that he was hearing, and he came. but as he came back by the church, he heard the voice again. He sat in the parking lot for some time, before he got the courage to come in. As the prayer was made for deliverance, he said he felt a warm, soothing sensation come all over his body, into his lungs, and up and out of his mouth. He declared his healing in a week, and later in the week, his doctors had confirmed it. <clears throat> that night, many visitors who were in town for the holidays made their way to God as this man asked them to join him at the front of the building. Several healings and miracles were reported, and many of the people of different faiths received the Holy Ghost. This man, who had never been to a church before, prayed for people as, he, as we had prayed for him. And faith multiplied in that building among the people. I learned a valuable lesson that night. If, I, if we will operate in the faith and not be afraid of the risks, God will take that seed of faith and multiply it to those around us. We contend for the faith by stepping out in faith and allowing our faith to multiply. Stand together with me tonight. So we are most likely the only example of faith that those around us will see. I'm not talking about, obviously, those other, others in the church, although those who are new to church or very first experience, they need to see that out of us. But those around us, us <clears throat> a lot of times the only faith they'll ever see is us. And I was actually talking, I had an opportunity to speak with a 16-year-old boy that works for me on the way home from work. He's been through quite a lot in the last few years, and, and I, I can't even begin to understand some of the things that has happened in his family growing up. It's been a very, very hard life for a young boy uh, in some ways. And, and I was talking to him about, and as I, he's always went to church his whole life, but he doesn't really have a, a great, other than he, his youth pastor who he really looks up to, he doesn't have a really good relationship with either of the churches he goes to. He doesn't really like them. And I was talking to him about stuff, and he was asking me about faith, and this is actually before I'd even really that much studying on this lesson, and uh, I said to him, I said, well, it says in Hebrews, I said, it, I said faith, it, it, it's, not, it, it's not something that science can prove. I said, otherwise it wouldn't be faith. If I could pull out something, say, well, okay, right here, you can see this physical evidence of Jesus. I said, I said, what would it be worth to believe in a God that was so easily explained? I said, the, in Hebrews it says, now faith <clears throat> is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. That's what faith is. I said, a God that's easily explainable is not a God worth worshiping. A God that is easily understandable for the human brain. But at the same time, with faith, God is so easy to understand. How We don't fathom all of how great he is, but we can understand that he is a great and mighty God. And without faith, where are we? And without, without our faith, where are those around us? So we are, as, the, as the, the lesson series we're doing right now, contending for the faith. 
We are. And we are producing the faith. We are exemplifying the faith. And we are the, the faith that reaches out to others. So let's pray tonight that God <clears throat> works through each and every one of us. God uses our faith to show those around us how great he is. Lord Jesus, we thank you for being with us tonight, Lord. We thank you for this word from you, God. We know that we, have, we can have great faith, that you can do all things. Lord, we know you can do all things. Lord, you have proved yourself so many times to each and every one of us. Lord Jesus, that those who are, we are working with, those around us, those that we not, aren't even aware are listening, Lord Jesus, that they would see and hear faith come through us. <clears throat> Lord, that we could exemplify who you are and what you can do everywhere we go, Lord Jesus. Lord, we know that we take you everywhere that we are. Lord, let us be good stewards of who you are. Let us be good examples to those around us. Lord, we thank you for the mighty outpouring that we are going to experience that is going to start through the faith that we have in you. We thank you for everything you are doing here, God. We lift up your mighty name and we worship you. In the mighty name of Jesus, we praise you. God bless you and let's all go in faith.